Um, I can't rap, I'm sorry. Um, it is a real honour to be here today um, and I'm going to be discussing the need to transition from an economy underpinned by extraction to one centred on sustainability, on justice and of course on well-being. This year alone we've seen the devastation of the climate and environmental crisis. The UK experienced the hottest temperature on record, millions lost their homes to devastating floods in Pakistan and parts of the Greater Horn of Africa face the fifth consecutive failed rainy season while nature's decline is unprecedented. A recent UN report confirmed what nature was already telling us. We are perilously off track to meet the Paris Agreement goals. Without action, urgent and um, comprehensive, we are hurtling towards the grave prospect of a 1.8 degrees Celsius trajectory. Underpinning today's urgent and intertwined crises from inequalities to the climate and environmental crises, is an unjust and extractive economic system. The time for timid, incremental change is long gone. In place of this, we need to fundamentally rewire the operations of our economy. Intrinsically linked to inequality, the causes and distributional consequences of the climate and environmental crisis are unevenly felt, both within and between countries and global regions. And those who have contributed the least to this crisis so often face the front, are at the front line. Our social class, our gender, race, age, disability and geography, for example, all influence how susceptible we are to facing climate harms. Oxfam found that a, billion, a billionaire's average annual emissions is a million times higher than somebody outside the richest 10%. In 2020, annual emissions of carbon dioxide per head of population were 0.9 tonnes in Rwanda. In Britain, this figure was 8.3. And the richest 1% in the UK produce 11 times the carbon emissions of the poorest 50%. The current energy crisis is underscoring the entrenched inequalities in our, in our, uh, inbuilt into our economy, the sheer volatility and cost of our continued reliance on fossil fuels, and how the ownership and operations of our energy system point to deeper, more systemic failures of a privatised extractive energy market. Research by Commonwealth found that BP and Shell have remained profitable over the past decade and during that time have spent tens of millions of pounds on shareholder payouts while receiving hundreds of millions of pounds in tax benefits. And over the past five years alone, the big six energy firms have paid out the equivalent of 82% of their pre-tax profits in dividends. This latest crisis is emblematic of the wider challenges we face in our economy. Footloose private fossil capital benefiting from eye-watering pr profits, while workers face real wage losses. Fuel poverty soars and the climate crisis rages on. What is Scotland's role in contributing to this? What action can we take to further um, create a well-being economy? Well, first and foremost, Scotland is a founding member, of course, of the Wellbeing Economy Governments Group. And the country has made important strides to tackle the climate and environmental emergency, not least by committing to reaching net zero um, by 2045. But despite meaningful progress, challenges and indeed opportunities lie ahead to rapidly decarbonise the economy as part of a just transition. Our economy still remains heavily reliant on fossil fuels and extraction, both in terms of our key sectors and our jobs. And income and wealth inequality remains scandalously high. While some of the economic levers required to steward a just transition sit at a UK government level, for instance, enhancing regulatory frameworks and ushering in a new deal of workers' rights to enshrine a just transition in decent work, Scotland can take further action to deepen and accelerate the transition to a genuinely well-being economy. And I'm going to speak about just four areas where we can do that. The first of those is in transforming land. Land reform is undoubtedly one of the greatest achievements of the Scottish Parliament. From, and from restoring nature to biodiversity, to housing justice, to repopulating and repeopling land, land is crucial to um, achieving a well-being economy. But emerging changes to Scotland's rural land market risk undermining progress and reinforcing an, an extractive land market. 
Scotland's large rural landmass concentrated pattern of ownership in land, lightly regulated land market and generous tax and subsidies regime means that it is highly attractive for investors seeking to purchase land for carbon offsetting purposes, contributing to an upwards pressure on rural land prices. The risk here is that the financial re rewards from the so-called natural capital potential could flow to a small number of private landowners, triggering wider impl um, implications from pushing up rents um, and making it increasingly difficult for rural communities to fulfil their economic potential. In addition, allowing polluters to offset their emission risks facilitating greenwashing on a vast scale and, and distracting from the more important yet much more difficult challenge of reducing direct emissions. An action can be taken um, not least through creating a community wealth building approach to land reform. A few examples of what we can do, we can strengthen community right to buy, we can introduce a new, regulatory, a new statutory power to apply a public interest test to land over a certain size, we can create a mandatory system of certification for carbon credits um, to ensure much greater scrutiny of sellers and buyers, and we can set out a long-term ambition to introduce a land value tax. The second area I want to speak about is perhaps unsurprisingly, given the current context, energy systems. Energy systems is an area that requires UK government action, um, from reforming fossil fuel support in our tax system to developing a publicly owned approach to energy. But there are critical areas of development in Scotland. Yet while um, Scotland has expanded renewable uh, energy generation in recent years, it's not yet captured the full potential of economic benefits, both in terms of its key jobs, um, and scaling those jobs and its domestic supply chains. Critically, while the fossil fuel age has been characterised by concentrated ownership, the transition to a green economy gives us a chance to create a more equitable, democratic energy infrastructure that's genuinely fit for the future, generating good, unionised, green jobs throughout the country while we do so. There is a need to ensure that renewables directly benefit the wider public good and indeed communities so that their benefits do not just flow to multinationals. In North Ayrshire, where I've been lucky enough to sit on the expert group over the past few years, part of their community wealth building strategy involves generating clean, green, council-owned renewables projects. If successful, these proposed projects could potentially generate 277% of North Ayrshire's um, future energy demands, and the excess, ener uh, excess energy could be potentially sold to other public anchor institutions in the area. Third, and linked to the energy crisis and the current cost of living crisis, is the need to create safe, warm, affordable homes for all. Fuel poverty is devastating. It is household debt, it is homelessness, it is lifelong respiratory and heart conditions. The current crisis necessitates that we accelerate home retrofitting as a social priority, but also um, as a means to tackle the core objectives of the Scottish Government, like reducing fuel poverty, creating jobs in every constituency that are green, um, and rapidly reducing household emissions. Alongside this um, is the need to ensure that homes are affordable and available. The commitment to expand the social home stock, um, as well as the commitments to ensure um, enshrine new um, private renter protections, and of course the recent rent freeze marks significant progress. But building a well-being economy means recognising that homes are a basic need, not a financial asset for accumulating wealth. In 2021, rents went up by almost 10% in uh, Edinburgh, in Glasgow and in the Highlands. Um, and we see numbers of people in private rented sector in poverty soaring. Um, the rent freeze should be a first step in a, uh, the first step towards initiating effective widespread rent controls. And we should look at establishing municipal energy companies as well, which could develop, own and deliver low carbon heat, like district heating systems, um, and efficiency in efficient energy in infrastructure. Last, but by no means least, we need to initiate a green industrial strategy. Ensuring that Scotland can prosper from decarbonisation and deliver well-paid green jobs will require a fundamental restructure of both our industrial base and our labour market. Essential here is the need to ensure that Scotland's fossil fuel workers and our communities are never treated like Thatcher treated the coal miners, with action to address historic problems of chronically low investment, low pay and the prevalence of extractive business models. 
This requires the state to shift away from simply intervening when industries and businesses fail to a proactive role for the state to steward a green industrial strategy. This means harnessing policy levers to accelerate decarbonisation and create a fairer, more democratic economy. It means protecting the livelihoods of those impacted through active labour market policies. It means building on the fair work agenda. Um, and it means scaling green, unionised, decent jobs, including through an enhanced domestic manufacturing base. A green industrial strategy also gives us an opportunity to look beyond what we might conventionally see as green jobs. Care work, for example, is not only vital to delivering the human needs required for our survival, it is also low carbon in nature, it is green work. As such, it should be integral to a green industrial strategy, as integral as any uh, export-led industry. I'll finish up by saying that the climate and environmental crises are incomprehensibly devastating. And those benefiting from an extractive and unequal economy will fight very hard for its continuation, as will those paid to represent their interests. But an opportunity exists here to rapidly decarbonise the economy, challenge power imbalances, build worker power and create a reparative agenda. And Scotland is well placed to deliver a rewired economy with well-being at its heart. Thank you.